All right, Deuteronomy chapter 16. Um, let's read. Tell you what. Let, let's read 1 through 8, and then we'll have somebody read 9 through 12, and then 13 through 17. We'll just go ahead and get these, but break the reading up, because they kind of all are going to go together when we begin to talk about them. So, uh, Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 8. Who will grab that wrong? Observe the month of Achab and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Achab, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. Therefore, you shall sacrifice the Passover to the Lord your God from the flock and from the herd in the place where the Lord chooses to put his name. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it. That is the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that you may remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. And no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory for seven days, nor shall any of the meat which you sacrifice the first day at twilight remain overnight until morning. You may not sacrifice the Passover within any of your gates which the Lord your God gives you. But at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide, there you shall sacrifice the Passover at twilight, at the going down of the sun, at the time you came out of Egypt. And you shall roast and eat it in the place which the Lord your God chooses. And in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. Six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a sacred assembly to the Lord your God. You shall not, excuse me, you shall do no work on it. And 9 through 12, who will grab that, Elijah? You shall count seven weeks for yourself. <clears throat> begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. Then you shall keep the feast of the weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a free will offering from your hand which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your gates, the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are among you, at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and that you, sh and you shall be careful to observe all these statutes. And 13 to 17. Philip? You shall observe the feast of the tabernacles seven days, when you have gathered from your threshing floor and from your wine press. And you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levi, the stranger and the fatherless, and the widow who are within your gates. Seven days you shall keep the sacred feast of the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you sure so that you surely rejoice. Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the feast of unleavened bread, at the feast of weeks, and at the feast of tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord in your hand. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God which he has given you. Okay, so as it wraps up there, those last two verses tell us that these are three of the feasts that God had prescribed that when they get into the land of Canaan, they were to go to a central location to observe these feasts. Um, and they weren't free to observe them wherever they wanted to. They could not do that in their hometown, at their home, at their land, wherever they may be. But they had to travel and go down to the central location. Of course, eventually that ends up being Jerusalem with the temple being built there. And that's where they observe those things. But what are these three feasts? Question one, I asked, note the three feasts and a few key points about each one. So what are they, first of all? You may have even little subheadings in there. Okay, the Passover, which is tied with what? Yeah, Feast of Unleavened Bread. They, they went together. The Passover was the day before the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
And quite often in the Bible, they're interchangeable. When it talks about the Passover, it also includes unleavened bread. It talks about Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's also including the Passover just because they were tied together right there. Uh, what's the next feast that he talks about? Feast of, feast of Weast. <laughs> feast of Weeks, which is also what? Pentecost, right. Because it talks about the, the seven Sabbaths and then the, the day after, which is the Pentecost. Uh, which, by the way, in Acts chapter 2, that's where it gets to the day of putting the Pentecost has fully come. That means it was Sunday morning when those events unfolded in Acts 2. So there's that. And then the last one, of course, Feast of Tabernacles. What are each one of these for? Passover and unleavened bread. What's that associated with? What's he telling them? You need to think about remember. Yeah, when you're freed from Egypt. And it goes back to they were to take all the leaven out. They offer the, the sacrificial lamb, the, the Paschal lamb, Passover lamb. Um, the angel of death passed over. So that was to commemorate that occasion, them being delivered by that tenth plague. Um, and then the Pentecost, Feast of Harvest or Feast of Weeks. What's that about? Sort of just gave it away. Yeah, harvest. They, the ingathering. The, 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 they've got their first fruits that are coming in. Uh, and they're to think about the bountiful blessings of God. And then what about the tabernacles? What's it also called, by the way? It's just another word for tabernacle. Yeah, Feast of Booths. And what do they do then? They made these little booths and they camped out in the old place. Yeah, when you, when you, we read booth, but really what is it? Yeah, it's a little tent, little shack type thing that they would build, they would set up out there and they would celebrate this feast. And, and what was it in commemoration of? Harvest. Well, the, the harvest is Feast of, of Weeks. It was uh, to remember that God uh, looked out at them in the wilderness. Yeah, the main thing is um, that they're to remember about the time they, they were traveling, that God looked out for them and God provided for them in that wilderness. Um, so, you've got all those feasts there. Are there any parallels in the New Testament. Well, you got Pentecost, of course. Um, but that that specific one that they had, anyone can come to of any nation can come to, which is what kind of makes it very special what happened there in Acts chapter two. Um, because that that feast that they were celebrating, anybody could come into it. Well, the, the Jews came in, devout Jews from under every nation under heaven came and gathered for that, and then they spoke the languages, and it amazed the people, and it, it reinforced this is God at work here. Um, you, you've got the, the Passover, which the closest thing to it in the New Testament, obviously what? Lord's yeah, Lord's Supper, because that's the night the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper. Take the unleavened bread, take the fruit of the vine, remember my body, remember my blood. And so it's remembering that sacrifice that opened the door for delivery, just like the Passover in Egypt opened that door for them to leave slavery. The sacrifice of Christ, the Lamb of God, opened that door for us to leave the slavery of sin. What about Pentecost? Well, well, Mike referenced it a minute ago, but where's the, the tie in? What happened there in Acts 2 on that day of Pentecost? Got the, the speaking in tongues of the sermon so everybody can hear and understand. You had baptism, uh, about 3,000 souls, and you had the Lord added to the church. Okay, you have the 3,000, you have a great harvest beginning to come in, the beginning of the harvest of souls in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So that, that's the connection there. And that's obviously why the Lord chose Pentecost to do that. Well, you have the practical thing of all the people gathered there. You have an audience there. But it's also playing on that imagery of that history of the purpose and the point 
of that feast, just like him establishing the Lord's Supper. Um, what about tabernacles? Anything in the New Testament you think of that might touch on at least the meaning or the purpose or the idea? I think it's brought up an idea that this is a permanent kind of a journey to something better if you go to the promised land. Okay, we're strangers and pilgrims, just like they were wandering. We're wandering in our wilderness right now. And the Lord tells us in Matthew chapter 6, we need to trust in the Lord just as they needed to trust in the Lord when they were in the wilderness and they were unsettled and, and going through difficult areas that we need to trust in the Lord as we're going through this life. You know, seek first the kingdom of God and what will happen. All these things will be added to you. He'll look out for you. We need to be ever mindful that the Lord is looking out for us and providing us. And any other thoughts there on those three feasts? Just that Paul mentions the idea of cleaning out the old oven in 1 Corinthians 5, trying to deal with division and specific sins that the church is not addressing. And he talks about leaven and that Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed in that context. Exactly, yeah, with Him being our Passover, we got to get rid of that leaven of sin. It doesn't belong in the church. It can't be in there. Yes. Uh, yeah, something I had not actually noticed, though I probably read it a lot of times, is that in this reference it refers to the unloved bread as the bread of affliction. And, and we know that bread represents Christ's body. And that was just striking bread of affliction. He specifically calls it that. Right. Bread of affliction. And remember originally when they made it and part of that Passover observance they eat it with what kind of herbs? Bitter herbs. Bitter herbs. There, there's, you see that reasoning. It's In the Old Covenant of course there were physical material things that were to reinforce spiritual lessons for them. And so this reference on the bread of affliction is one of those things to reinforce there, there is sacrifice, there is suffering associated with it, but it's leading to something better. Um, so, again, it says every male is to appear there where the Lord designates, and they are not to come empty handed. Um, the New American Commentary says regarding this, it's kind of like them coming to these feasts and they're renewing a pledge of loyalty to the Lord. They're rededicating themselves to Him, of course, and drawing close to Him. And you've got the males, it says, who are responsible for this. That It's their duty, their job, they're the spiritual leaders, they're to be actively engaged in this, and everyone must come. All the males were required to come. Uh, so, question number two, we'll just briefly touch on this. Can you find where any of these feasts were observed in the New Testament? As we mentioned, Pentecost, go ahead. Well, Matthew 26 and the other gospel accounts of mm -hmm. the institution of the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. What they were observing at that time was the Passover. Yes, and it's interesting in the book of John that the Passover is mentioned three times, and that's how we measure the Lord's ministry that we figure three, three and a half years because it mentions three different Passovers and just sort of putting the pieces together, you understand that's, that's the time frame that we have of Him working with His disciples, preparing them for their mission once He would ascend back to heaven. So we've got the Passover there, we've got Pentecost we mentioned in Acts 2. Uh, you read a couple places where Paul was hurrying to make the feast of the Passover and things, or the Pentecost, things like that. Uh, anybody remember the Feast of Tabernacles? Did you get a reference on that? John 7. Yeah, John 7. It's just interesting that all these are mentioned, and all of them, you have the Lord uh, at some point or another, of course, that He would observe them and participate in them. And the disciples did, at least in the gospel accounts, for sure, because they were under that system. Because they did, they they lived under that system. 
Now, the same thing would be true for the Sabbath. They observed the Sabbath. It's because they were under that system. But once the gospel was established, they were not required to observe any of these things. That they didn't observe the Sabbath as a matter of the law. They didn't observe any of the other feasts as a matter of the law. We're not under obligation to keep them is the point. There are people today who say, we have to keep the Sabbath. Well, if we have to keep the Sabbath, we also have to keep all these feasts. And if we have to keep all these feasts, what do we have to do? What's that? Yeah, really, you have to keep the whole law. But in this chapter here, what does he close up with? Bring the sacrifice. We've got to go to Jerusalem. <laughs> well, I mean, we've, we've got to go. With all the males are supposed to go to one place. Um, so it, it just helps to highlight the absurdity of saying we go back and keep the old law. We don't. We're not under any obligation for that. All right. Let's, let's press on because I want to spend the rest of our time with chapter 16, verse 18 down through the, uh, 17. And just notice what's being talked about here. Very important things. Let's read um, 16, 18 to 22 to start with. Who will get that for us? 16, 18 to 22. Logan, you want to get that? You shall appoint for yourself judges and officers in all your towns, which the Lord your God has given you, according to your tribes, and they shall judge you to the people with righteous judgment. You shall not distort justice, you shall not be partial, and you shall not take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall pursue, that you may live and possess the land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall not plant for yourself an asher of any kind of tree, beside the altar of the Lord your God, which you, may, which you shall make for yourself. You shall not set up for yourself a sacred pillar, which the Lord your God hates. Okay. So, first thing he says, verse 18, is you go in and you do what? And why? Judges. You appoint judges. So they can judge the people. Where are they to be appointed? Yeah. Towns, all your gates. So throughout the country, you're to have this. He, he's setting up a judicial system for them to operate on. Yeah, they're going to be distributed among the tribes there. And what does he admonish these judges to do? What is supposed to be their mode of operating, if you will? Okay, impartial. Why might they be partial? Well, because it could be related to a lot of these people. <laughs> okay. Right. Could could be related to them. Cousin Joe or, you know, your son or your daughter or your parents or somebody, your close friend. Um, could be these people. you got to be careful. Don't be partial in these judgments. What's another thing that's going to corrupt the justice? Making sure you're not taking gifts. Taking bribes, right? Um, there is a problem that is persistent pretty much in any society that wealth sometimes blinds justice. Uh, celebrity can blind justice at times. Different things that pull the wool over people's eyes and there's just nothing done about that because of the wealth, the money, the celebrity, the fame, the, the power maybe that an individual has. And so he's saying you, you cannot have that among your people. Um, you're going to possess the land by the justness that exists in that land. And if you pervert it, the idea is you're going to end up losing that. So in 21 and 22, what does he say? Don't do it. Yeah, don't make any wooden images. It's another reminder, and he's fitting it in here in this thing of justice. You cannot be setting up these idolatrous images or idolatrous pillars. You can't have any of that. That is not your system. That is not the way you live. Those are not the things that you're to give your devotion or allegiance to. Um, all right, so 17... 
Let's read 1 through 7 here. Deuteronomy 17, 1 through 7. Oh. You shall not sacrifice to the Lord your God a bull or a sheep which has any blemish or defect, for that is an abomination to the Lord your God. If there is found among you within any of your gates which the Lord your God gives you, a man or a woman who has been wicked in the sight of the Lord your God in transgressing his covenant, who has gone and served other gods and worshipped them, either the sun or the moon, or any of the host of heaven, which I have commanded, and it is told you, and you hear of it, then you shall inquire diligently. And if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination has been committed in Israel, then you shall bring out to your gates that man or woman who has committed that wicked thing, and shall stone to death that man or woman with stones. Whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Excuse me. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. The hands of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death and afterward the hands of all the people. So you shall put away the evil from among you. Okay. So question number one, or question three rather, uh, in verse one, what's the underlying principle of the command? Do not sacrifice bull or sheep which has any blemish or defect. Pure. Pure? Only your best. You can only offer your best. Right. The Lord deserves the best that we have. Not the defective, not the leftover, not the broken down. God deserves the very best that we have. And we have the best sacrifice through Christ who is pure. So. Yes, he, all of this is pointing toward that perfect pure sacrifice in Christ. Um, the pulpit commentary made note, or rather the expositor's Bible commentary made note, that the quality of the sacrifice reflects the esteem of the worshiper. So what we offer to God reflects what we think about God. That flows through every area of our life, and especially when we come in the presence of God, it reflects what we think about Him. So we have to be mindful of that. That's a principle that's laid out here. So any other thoughts on verse 1 there? So he, he says, don't make any wooden image. And when you come before God, offer your very best. You can't offer anything with the blemish or defect in it. And then what does he bring up? Verses 2 to 7. Not getting caught up in my horoscopes and the sun and the stars because... When they were in Egypt, the Egyptians, they studied, they worshipped, they had multiple gods, and that was a very big part of their religious. So he's reminding them that that's not what you're supposed to do now. That's not what dictates your world and your life. It's right. Yeah, the, don't get caught up in this idolatry of worship, worshiping these images, the, these uh, things in nature here. Um, so he says, you need to have judges that will judge the people. And he says, don't have idolatry and don't offer me corrupt worship. And now he's getting into, when somebody violates this, here's what you do. This is what's supposed to take place. If they get caught up in idolatry, and what do you do to them? Stone them. So, it says you somebody reports idolatry, what's the first thing they're to do? Investigate. Investigate. Right? Uh, have you all ever heard a rumor that wasn't true? <laughs> okay, this past... Oh, I can't even remember when it was. But anyways, so... We've been here a little over a year now. Sometime in the past year, okay, my mom told me, oh, somebody that she talked to 
said that the governor is going to close the borders to North Carolina, and so we better not leave on a going out of time trip because we won't be able to get back in. And I immediately was like, that's crazy. There's no way they could ever do that. It's just not possible. But, you know, these crazy things get started, and there are people who get caught up in it, and they repeat it, and they repeat, you know, don't tell my mama. <laughs> but, but, you know, there are things that you could imagine there would be reports that would go out, and he's saying here, don't just believe everything you hear. You need to investigate, find out, get the facts, and, and determine whether or not it's so. And if it is so, then that is wickedness. That is sin. And you take them and you stone them to death. And what are the stipulations around somebody being stoned to death? Have to have two or three witnesses at least. Can't just do it on the testimony of one. You could imagine revenge taking place in those situations. Philip? Witnesses are the ones that basically cast the first stone. They're the ones that have to start. Right. Laying hands on the first. And why would he make that stipulation? Why would God put that in there? Better be telling the truth. Yeah. Better be telling the truth. Right. Because you're the one that's going to have to act on this. You have to do it. It's one thing to want somebody stoned to death. It's another thing that you are the one who initiates that. So it, it's a it's a measure of um, safety, if you will. Mike? When you think about the trial of Jesus also, they didn't want his blood on their hands. I see that much later on in Acts chapter 2. Talked about the reason that you know. So um, you know, I think that, you know, why that's in there to say but you're going to be held to the same standard that you're holding someone else to. Right, and imagine them wrongly accusing someone, stoning them to death, and then the next day or a year later or five years later, ten years, it's going to just eat away at them what they've done. So yeah, it, it's, it's a measure of safety that's being put in there. And he says, you do this, the very last part of verse 7, for what purpose, to what end? <laughs> Get rid of the wickedness. Remove evil from among you. You need to keep the congregation pure. I was going to mention that very thing, Stephen, that as he's describing the sacrifices in their conduct, in their behavior, what God... Is telling them that anything less than that is an abomination to them. It's mm -hmm. distasteful to them. Mm -hmm. And that you know, God is holy and therefore we are to be holy. Exactly. Exactly. We're to reflect that esteem and respect that we have for God in our actions. And he's carrying it out here that, you know, if that's going on, you've got to get rid of that among you. So question number four I had asked, does the death penalty devalue life? Why or why not? Right. The the death penalty originally in Genesis chapter nine was instituted because of the value of human life. There is no death penalty in the Bible for killing an animal. You repay somebody, but you're not put to death. There is the death penalty when you wrongly kill another human being. It's because they're made in the image of God. And it's showing there is value in that life above every other life that exists in this universe. And so it upholds the value of life. And it flows through here in this and saying, look, God demands that you as his people honor him and worship him and if you don't as his people you're to be stoned to death that's in the nation of Israel now today what happens to people who are among God's people but turn to idolatry what happens with them they're withdrawn from okay they spiritually die 
right? They're cut off from God, but then they're withdrawn from, they're removed from out of the congregation. Get rid of that evil from among you, as Zach was mentioning a while ago in 1 Corinthians 5. He particularly talks about, you know, you purge out that old leaven. You get rid of that out of the congregation so it doesn't corrupt everyone else. All right, so, um, let's read verses 8 through 13. Deuteronomy 17, 8 through 13, who will get that for us? Philip. The matter arises which is too hard for you to judge between degrees of guilt or bloodshed, between one judgment or another, or between one punishment or another, matters of controversy within your case, then you shall arise and go up to the place which the Lord your God chooses, and you shall come to the priest, the Levites, and to the judge there in those days, and inquire of him. They shall pronounce upon you the sentence of judgment. You shall do according to the sentence which they pronounce upon you in that place which the Lord chooses. And you shall be careful to do according to all that they order you, according to the sentence of the law in which they instruct you, according to the judgment which they tell you you shall do. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left from the sentence which they pronounce upon you. Now the man who acts presumptuously and will not heed the priest who stands and minister there before the Lord your God or the judge, that man shall die. So you shall put away the evil from Israel, and all the people shall hear and fear and no longer act presumptuously. So what's this section covering? Okay, yeah, the priest presumably having what advantage? Okay, maybe closer to God, the ear of God, the high priest in particular, maybe. Anything else? They should really know the law and then how to apply that. If there is some type of question or uncertainty among these people. You could imagine in some of these towns and villages or whatever that at times the people are just not going to have the kind of knowledge of law that they really need in a particular case. And so they, they've got to take it on up, if you will, uh, that system in order to make sure that the right thing is done. Now, when he says that the Levites or the priests, they, they give that judgment what happens? What does he tell them they must do? You got to do what they tell you to do. So, I don't know, maybe sometimes they're a little reluctant because they see where it's going. They're like, mm, let's take this on up. You got to do it. Verse 12, though. Something else I was going to ask. Yes, yeah, go ahead. The high priest had a year on the temple. Mm -hmm. And wasn't that to give them the means of judgment uh, as we understand as it was first described in Aaron? And so the high priest was to wear the breastplate that contained the urine and the duma. Yes. So as you're saying, as they continue to elevate this, it reaches that point. Right, um, yeah. Like Philip said, the, the, they've got that ear of God, so to speak, they use those to, to make a judgment when it just gets too hard for them. They would use that. And don't ask me how that all worked. I just know what it says. But yes, exactly right. And so it gets up there. They make that judgment. You need to follow through with it. But verse 12. Yeah, somebody who acts presumptuously will not heed the priest that man's to be executed. How serious is he about following the law? Dead. Deadly serious. Yeah, exactly right. All right, uh, let's read 14 to 20. And I, I'm hurrying because I want to get to something at the end here. 14 to 20, who will read that for us? Go ahead, Jesse. When you come to the land which the Lord your God has given you, and possess it, dwell on it, and say, I will set a king over me like all the other nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you, the Lord your God chooses, 
one from among your brethren, you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you, who is by your brother. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way ever again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Also, it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law and book, from the one before the priests, the Levites. And that shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. That his heart may not be, may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandments of the right hand nor to the left, and that he may prolong his days in the kingdom, he and his children, and the of Israel. Okay, so he's anticipating the time that they're going to have kings. If you back up to um, promises made to Abraham, one of the promises is, from you will come kings. And then you go forward a little bit to Judah when uh, Jacob, or Israel, is blessing his sons. He says of Judah that the scepter will not depart from Shiloh, you know, or scepter not to part from Judah until a Shiloh come. Well, a scepter is referring to a king and a ruler, right? So God always knew they were going to have a king. Here he's telling them, you're going to have a king and you're going to ask for one because you're going to look at all these other nations. He's not approving of it. And when you get into 1 Samuel, as the question 5 deals with, that they do ask for a king because they wanted to be like all the other nations. So they had the wrong intent. They were rejecting God. They weren't asking for a king because they wanted someone to lead them in doing God's will and living God's way, to be that example, to enforce the law. They weren't asking for that. They were asking for a king because they thought, well, we want to be like everybody else around us. So wrong motive there, but what's the stipulation that he puts on this? And we'll just jump to question six. List the rules God gave to govern kings and which one stands out above all others if you saw one that stood out. Well, actually two of them are The most important one is that you read the Bible, that you can study the law every day so you can administer justice. Now study the law. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and if you look but to, to Joe's point, had to be from their brethren. It could not be a foreigner. If you go back in history, it's pretty frequent that foreigners ruled as kings over a different people. In fact, there, there's a pretty strong indication that during Jacob's time, or rather Joseph's time in Egypt, there was a foreign king actually serving as the Pharaoh. And then when the Egyptians took over, that's, that's when the problems came and they oppressed the children of Israel, things like that. They were afraid another person would come from the outside and take them over. Um, the, the Ptolemies were Greek. They weren't Egyptians. Um, when, when you look at all kinds of different nations in Europe, that they... All those kings were basically cousins, you know, for a while to each other. I think today maybe a lot of them are still, you know, blood related. Essentially a, a family or two ruling all of Europe. And that's not their native country. And so, yeah, there's a very important principle in there. Any other thoughts there? Philip? Not only did he have to study the law, he had to write his own copy. Had to make his own copy. How well would you learn the law if you're writing that out, right? And let's understand when he's saying write out this law, 
it's really not a reference to he needs to copy all of Genesis down. He needs to copy. But the law, when you get you know, to Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Deuteronomy perhaps even, but that's the things you're to write out, those things, so he would know this. Nancy. Uh, I also uh, had that he had to be careful to observe it all. He was the number one example to the people. Right. He had to live it out in his life. Well, also, he had to uh, copy it in the presence of the, the priests. So, to make sure that he had it right. Yeah, they would not so want a corrupt copy. Like, oh, I'll help us jot this down. Right. Uh, I don't like that one. Yeah. So. Oh, I'm going to change it up. Yeah. Could not do that. He, he had to write that down correctly and live by it. All right. Any other thoughts there? Yeah, the psalm is, I think, would be the best example of a guy that's so wise, so gifted with God's wisdom. And yet, the warning that God puts here about the horses, the wives. He didn't come back to, ended up, I don't know how it was, but I know certainly he fell away. Right. Whether he repented later on. Okay, I'm going to give you my theory real quick, and then, then I'm going to uh, wrap this up on something I want us to think about. My, my firm conviction is Solomon repented, because he's got, is it three books? In the Bible, I just don't see God having a guy put three books in the Bible who, in the end, lost his soul. So that's that's my theory for what it's worth. All right, very good. So thinking about this, it says he is to fear the Lord and be careful to observe it. So he's to copy the law, he's to read that law, he is to fear the Lord and observe it. What's the whole duty of man? Fear God. Fear God and keep His commandments. That's built in right here, right? It says that's what the king must do. So they were going to ask for a king, but he says, you know, you're going to have a king, but God's going to pick the king, and here's what he must do. This is how he must live and behave. This is what's to govern him as a man sitting on the throne. Um, all right. So what I want to think about, I don't know if I want to, yeah, I want to write this down. Okay. So, it just occurred to me going through this. Foundations of a just and prosperous society. One of the first ones is law. Why, why would law be a foundation of a just and prosperous society? Because we have people in our nation trying to get rid of law. But why is law... Law is a force to govern. The strength of the governing is found in the teeth of the law. If the law is not enforced, then there is no governance. There is no civility. Yeah, there's no civility. There, there's a common standard by which society is to live. Clint? Uh, so, it's, it's, a, it's a standard. You know, an inch is an inch. A foot is a foot. Nobody has the right to say that my inch is better than yours. Right, right. There, there are clear guidelines on what is and what is not acceptable. It's a shared agreement. It's a compact. We in our nation live under the compact of the Constitution. We, we've all agreed that that's the law that governs this land. Now, whether you have explicitly agreed to that or implicitly, if you're a citizen of this nation, that's what you've agreed to. You live in this nation. That's what you agree to. We, we have to have citizens that do what? Citizens that respect, right, the law. Because you can have a law, but if people don't respect it, what happens? They ignore it. It all falls apart. So we have to follow it personally. We have to help one another. Be accountable. You think about what he's saying there. You hear about idolatry, you investigate it, you find out that that's going on. Your hand needs to be the first when they're put to death. So as a community, we hold each other accountable to that law. 
We don't just turn a blind eye when people are blatantly, fragrantly ignoring it and violating it. And, if you will, a jury of our peers, right? I'm telling you that the, our nation is built on these principles that come from the Word of God. Uh, we help to enforce it. We're not to be suspicious of our neighbors, you know, always just spying on them, things like that. But we act when there's a clear violation. There has to be judges. Why do there have to be judges? It's just as we completed reading that, uh, you know, Philip was reading to us and discussing that there has to be a means of, of reaching a judgment and by having judges who understand the law and are in a position to uh, rule according to the law to set forth that level and going up to, as we have, a Supreme Court. Right. And we have local, you know, within societies, as we have within our cities, within our states, you know, within uh, our federal. Right, and you, you've got to, you've got to know when it's being violated and then applying the appropriate penalty to that. The judges have to be what? That started out, they, they enforce. Impartial, honest, right? And I think we've all seen there are times when there are dishonest judges and that wreaks havoc. Um, all right, so you've got, with, with these here, if you will, well, I'll, I'll put this other one down. So, I'm going to put leader instead of king. But you have to have leaders that are committed to the law. Um, from among the citizens, right? And th this isn't a U.S. lesson, but I mean, they put a provision in there. The president has to be a natural born citizen, right? Where, is it, where do they get that? The word of God, right? It has, it has to be from among you. Because that loyalty principle that Joe talked about a minute ago. And they're not to multiply horses. They're not to be power hungry people. Not to be compromising, weak and feckless and abdicating their duty. He says returning to Egypt. They can't compromise and, and just go back to Egypt. Like, this is too difficult. Let's just all go back to Egypt and return them there. He's to be a moral man, not governed by his fleshly passions. Don't multiply your wives. Not to be materialistic, multiplying gold and silver. He's to be studious and dedicated, knowing the law. Um, he observes the law in fear of the Lord and acknowledges he is under what? What's the last part there about the king? He's not supposed to consider himself to be above everybody else. What do we call that? We call that something. Okay, there, there's humble. Rule of law, right? Now, you got all this in Israel. We see echoes or reflections of that in our nation. Where else does this apply? Church. Church. Right? We have a law that we absolutely have to respect. And as citizens of the kingdom of God, we need to make sure that it's being followed and we help hold each other accountable to that law. And in that sense, we sit as judges. You know, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, well, can't you just judge among yourselves? See, we do judge each other. I know people get really upset about that sometimes, but we judge each other. If there's a violation that's taking place. We need to address that. We shouldn't shy away from it. And we shouldn't show partiality and favoritism among our friends and family, but that we apply it righteously. And leaders among God's people, they need to know the will of God. They need to observe it in the fear of the Lord. All right, any other thoughts? One more thing. Whatever we're talking about law... Isn't it like truth where it's not supposed to be ruled by our emotions? Instead, it's supposed to be logic? Yes. When we're talking about law, 
In the New Testament sense, we're talking about truth. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And that's to govern it. Not my emotions, my feelings, my desires. Exactly. Alright, thank you all very much. Lord willing, we'll press on next week.